Our final objection in this, in this series, again from the presentation, The Godhead and the Holy Spirit by Cornerstone Ministries. The speaker says here, and I quote, Early pioneers wrote against the Trinity. We must understand there are different trinities. Now he's speaking about a, a, a book on the pioneers that's been put out showing that all our pioneers did not believe in the Trinity, which is true. But the brothers trying to say here that they, they actually counted the Catholic Trinity. There are different trinities. And he says here, speaking about this book, you discover as you read and, and you look at the context, you can see that they're all talking against the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, just being morphed into this one being, this one God. So what the brethren are saying is, yes, it's true the pioneers opposed the Trinity, but they only, they only opposed this type of Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit being morphed into one being. Let's see how true that is. From that very book, James White. The inexplic inexplicable Trinity that makes the Godhead free in one and one in three is bad enough. That's the one the brother's talking about, being morphed into one. He said that's the only one that they're opposing. Let me read it again. You discover as you read and you look at the context, you can see that they're all talking against the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit just being morphed into one being, this one God. But here we see the diagram, the illustration on the right, taken from a book called The Trinity Confusion. Let me read underneath. It says, this picture is from a Catholic book depicting the Trinity, a well-accepted symbol called the Triquetra, equality, unity, and eternity. This is a Catholic diagram found in a Catholic book. Notice the triangle there, God in the middle. God is the Son, God is the Spirit, God is the Father. And then the outside ones are showing, the, it's showing the also being one, united one, and also being separate, which is, by the way, what Adventist Church teaches today by and large. And the proof of that is the one on the left. Identical symbol, identical illustration. One's Catholic. This one's from an Adventist uh, publication. It's called The New Pictorial Aid for Bible Study, page 75. The illustration is taken from a seven-day Adventist book entitled The New Pictorial Aid by Frank Breeden. It is an exact copy of that used by the Catholic and Protestant churches. So here we see we cannot, the objection does not hold that the Trinity Adventist Church believes in today is different from the Catholic Trinity. We see identical diagram. One's an Adventist uh, literature and one from the Catholic literature, and they're identical in every way. In fact, Adventists today, both conservatives, those mainstream, etc., they don't agree with each other. Some teach the Catholic Trinity. Others teach free, free uh, tritheism. Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. They are all co-equal, co-eternal. This is tritheism. And so there's confusion in, even in among themselves. Scripture teaches neither to be true. Scripture teaches that there is fun to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. Jesus himself in his prayer, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And as we've seen throughout this study, the Holy Spirit is both the Spirit of God and Christ, but not some third co-eternal being. All forms of Trinity, friends, are wrong. Regardless, if you want to say, my Trinity is not the one of the Catholic, or I don't believe in tritheism, it, it, it matters not. We saw from, from Cornerstone Ministries' presentation, we saw from Pastor Max Hatton, and we saw from Adventist Review, Gordon Jensen. We saw all three teaching the Holy Spirit as a third being. We saw the Brethren teach, we saw from Pastor Max Hatton's book, and the Adventist Review, we saw that they teach the Father and Son took roles. The divine beings took roles. We saw that Pastor Hatton say that they're metaphors, not literal. And so therefore, regardless of what trinity you believe in, when you and they all deny Christ is the only begotten Son of God, on this they're all, they're all in perfect unity, all of them. On this alone, you believe in the trinity, because you believe in three co-eternals. When you deny Christ is the only begotten Son of God, you deny what the Bible teaches. That's the form of the trinity. When you teach the Holy Spirit is a different individual being from the Father and the Son, as we've seen throughout this study, He's another comforter, another divine being. He's not the Father nor the Son. He's one of the co-eternal three. Once again, this is a Trinitarian teaching. 
So regardless of what form it is, it makes no difference. They're all, they're all wrong. They're all denying the, the Bible truth. It's irrelevant which form you believe in. They're all unscriptural and they all have pagan origin. And our church pioneers opposed all these types of teachings. Notice, friends, for example, M.C. Wilcox, the editor of Signs of the Times, this is 1898. I chose this statement because it's later in the ministry of Sister White. And notice how the truth had never changed what they believed in. This is one of our prominent publications at that time. And I quote here, God is the source of all life. God's life is eternal life, even as he is the eternal God. But God is a person. How can his life be everywhere present? Isn't that beautiful? God is everywhere present by his spirit. The presence of God is therefore his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is therefore the life of God. It's very straightforward, very simple. They did not believe the Holy Spirit to be somebody else, clearly, as we've seen throughout this study. It's his presence. It's God's spirit. It's his very life, the life of God. Notice this statement. Again, M.C. Wilcox, this is 1911. This is getting toward the end of Sister White's ministry, 1915. And again, from the publication at that time, somebody wrote in a question and it says, what is the difference between the Holy Spirit and the ministering spirits? Angels, or are they the same? So a brother's written in, or a brother or sister have written in, asking, is there a difference between ministering spirits and the Holy Spirit, or are they the same? Notice the answer. The Holy Spirit is the mighty energy of the Godhead, the life and power of God flowing out from him. Remember we saw earlier? He issues from the beams of his glory, emanating from the source of all power. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Brother Wilcox is saying here, the life and power of God flowing out from him to all parts of the universe and thus making a living connection between his throne and all, connect, all creation, as is expressed by another. He's quoting Sister White now. The Holy Spirit is the breath of spiritual life in the soul. The impartation of the Spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It thus makes Christ everywhere present. To use a crude illustration, just as a telephone carries the voice of a man and so makes that voice present miles away, so the Holy Spirit carries with it all the potency of Christ in making him everywhere present with all his power and revealing him to those in harmony with his law. Thus the Spirit is personified in Christ and God, but never revealed as a separate person. This is Francis' Signs of the Times, 1911, and the editor of the publication says the Spirit is personified as Christ and is never revealed as a separate person. He tells us it's the impartation of the life of Christ, quoting Sister White. Notice what he goes on to say. Never are we told to pray to the Spirit, but to God for the Spirit. Adventists today are praying to the Spirit. And nowhere in the Bible do you find that. Never do we find in the Scriptures prayers to the Spirit, but for the Spirit. M.C. Wilcox, Questions and Answers. So again, we see that pioneers, friends, objected all forms of Trinity. Trinity teaches the Holy Spirit someone else, as we've been seeing in this answer to Cornerstone Ministries presentation. Here we see our pioneers addressing that the Holy Spirit is never revealed as a separate person. And we're never to pray to the Spirit. What else did our pioneers say? E.J. Wagoner, 1888, Christ and His Righteousness, published in 1890. This is particularly of interest because we know how the prophet endorsed the message at the time. We have a small booklet we actually publish just on these statements from Brother Wagoner regarding the Holy Spirit and regarding the only begotten Son of God. Notice here, Christ and His Righteousness, page 19 and 24. Finally, we know the divine unity of the Father and the Son from the fact that both have the same Spirit. Paul, after saying that they are, that are in the flesh cannot please God, continues, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Notice what he concludes now from Romans 8, 9. Here we find that the Holy Spirit is both the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. This is from the 1888 message, friends. And they were not teaching a trinity in any way. 
They were totally opposed to the Trinity, all forms. And they clearly teaching the Spirit was both the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. What did he say regarding about the Son? Again, the same booklet, same message. The Word was in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. The mind of man cannot grasp the ages that are spanned in this phrase. It is not given to men to know when or how the Son was begotten. We know that Christ proceeded forth and came from God. John 8.42 But it was so far back in the ages of eternity as to be far beyond the grasp of the mind of man. Again, 1888 message. Elder Wagoner stating clearly the Spirit was the Spirit of God in Christ and here, quoting John 1.1 1, 1, and saying the mind of man cannot grasp the ages that are spanned in this phrase were not given to us to know when or how the Son was begotten. He quotes John 8.42 when Jesus said, I proceeded forth and came from God. And he says it's so far back in the ages of eternity that we cannot comprehend it. But he was clearly begotten. Once again, this statement condemns all forms of trinities, not just the Catholic trinity. All forms of trinity teach that Christ is co-eternal. 1888 message is teaching Christ is begotten. Notice again, same book, same message. Christ and his righteousness, page 12. The angels are sons of God as we, as was Adam by creation. Christians are the sons of God by adoption. But Christ is the son of God by birth. So Jesus is neither a son by adoption or any type of role play. He's certainly not a son by creation. How is he a son? By birth. And so Christ is the expressed image of his father's person. Now notice, friends, what we just read. That was in 1890. Now notice what Sister White wrote in Signs of the Times, 1895. Notice where she got it from, at least the fort. Because the brethren cannot say that, yes, Sister White endorsed the 1888 message, but not only per certain aspects, certainly not this aspect. Sister White here is stating exactly what we just read from Brother Wagner five years later. Brother Wagner says on the left... Angels are sons, as was Adam, by creation. Christians are sons of God by adoption. But Christ is a son by birth. And Christ is the express image of the Father's person. Now watch this. Sister White now speaking. Five years later, 1895. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not a son by creation, as were the angels. Nor a son by adoption, as is the forgiven sinner. Exactly what Brother Wagner said. Wagner said he was a son by birth. What does the prophet say? But a son begotten in the expressed image of the father's person. Here we see perfect harmony and inspiration endorsing the message of Wagner. Brother Jones said similar things. In our pioneer booklet, uh, we have compiled a number of statements there. Sister Wagner clearly endorsed. When she says a son begotten in the expressed image of his father's person, that does not refer to Bethlehem, friends. Christ was not born in the expressed image of his father's person in the brightness of his glory at Bethlehem. He took our fallen nature and it's accessible to all the weaknesses that we are accessible to. When she's talking about being begotten there, express image of the father's person, that was his birth in eternity. That's what Brother Wagner is talking about there. Angels are created. Christians are, are sons by adoption, a Christ by birth. And so the prophet harmonizes perfectly with that. So I pray that this presentation will be studied carefully and people will see that there is no room for having contradictions in what you believe. Everything has to line up. We have seen some of the most difficult inspired statements. First selected messages, 344. Evangelism, 615. Free living persons, heavenly trio. We have seen statements, another comfort in the Bible. John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, is come. We've been able to teach the truth from every one of these inspired statements and Bible verses and have perfect harmony with all of them. So friends, I appeal that everyone who watches this presentation to take these things to the Lord in prayer because we were warned that this would happen as the Apostle Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4. We're told, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, 
which we have not accepted. Inspiration tells us, as Paul was warning the church in Corinth, he's warning us today, and the churches throughout all time, that someone would come along, friends, and he'd come along and he'd bring another gospel to the church. And this other gospel would contain another Jesus and another spirit. That's what we've been seeing today. Brethren teaching that Christ is not the only begotten Son of God, that he's co-eternal. That the Father-Son relationship is only a metaphor. It's not literal. That divine beings went into some mysterious committee meeting and they drew straws and one chose to be a father, one chose to be a son. And I don't say that lightly, we read it. They just chose, I'll be this and I'll be that. We took roles. We've seen over and over again that they teach the Holy Spirit is not the Father and the Son. We've seen from their own statements that they teach he's another comforter, another divine being. So we've seen, friends, that they have another gospel. They have another Jesus and another spirit. And look what the Apostle says. Ye might well bear with him. In other words, him they accepted. That's what happened to the Adventist church, friends. Others came in. They brought this false pagan teaching with them. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And the church did well bear with them. They accepted it. But thank God today he's raising the banner of truth. And many humble souls are coming to see the light. And are coming out of this error and apostasy the church has plunged into. Remember, the believers at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended as Christ had promised, I will come to you. They were filled with the conscious presence of their ascended Lord. So those today preparing their lives and their hearts for the latter rain, they'll be thrilled to receive the outpouring of the latter rain. They'll be thrilled with the conscious presence of their ascended Lord, not some mysterious being they don't know, but someone who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The only one who can mediate on our behalf. The one who God sends his spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. At the end of the Brother Tony Riker's presentation for Cornerstone Ministries, he made this appeal, and I concur. He said, we have to get on with that work that God wants us to get on with, which is taking the gospel of a crucified and risen Saviour. And I don't doubt these reverend sincerity and the, how tirelessly they work in sharing the gospel in all the places they travel. But friends, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 11.4, we have to make sure we have the correct gospel. Particularly at this time, the Bible tells us in the past the Lord winked at our, at our ignorance. But not today, as this truth is being agitated, particularly as these brethren are, are acknowledging that they're reading this material. God will no longer wink, but command all men to repent. I agree with to take the work of God, to take his gospel to the world. But which one, friends? A gospel of metaphors, role plays, mysterious beings, a gospel that contradicts the whole Bible, a gospel that teaches another Jesus and another spirit, or we take the gospel of Christ to the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our eternal, loving Father, in Jesus' name we pray and thank Thee for Your Word. We thank Thee that the Gospel is not, Lord, of only for the learned, but it transcends all nations, all cultures, all generations. Every human being understands the eternal love a parent has for a child. And we can understand these words of Jesus. We don't need to go to some seminary to understand John 3.16 that has inspired and transformed hearts through the history of your church. And we know the power is as present there today as it ever was. And we know that the enemy is the one who is seeking to, seeking to remove this power, Lord, through false teachings that he has brought into thy church. We are told that Satan is determined that men shall not see the love of God, which led him to give his only begotten Son. And that's what we're seeing through these presentations and these books that are being written today. Satan using people to write, to teach studies, determined that men shall not see your love that led you to give your only begotten Son. Men today are writing and saying, it's only a metaphor. It's not true. It's not literal. That beings took roles. How can we know your love? How can we know what you gave? How can we know what Christ suffered? 
We thank you, Father, that regardless what the church is teaching today, nothing can be done against the truth but for the truth. The more this is agitated, the more you impress on the hearts of those who love thee, love thy truth, to stand and raise the banner. And the more it's agitated, the more people come to know the knowledge of the truth. We pray this message will go to many places, Lord. Touch the hearts of many, that none need to be deceived, and that they can clearly see it that there are no contradictions, and that your word is in perfect harmony with the inspired writings of Sister White. May we all come to believe, Lord, John 3.16. May we truly all come to believe that you truly gave your only begotten Son. And may we all come to truly believe the words of Jesus, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, as I pray in his name. Amen.